So we've got two teenagers at home, and there comes the time where we are having the talk, so let's talk about serverless. It's really an evolution. If you look at, you know, we've been doing, who has been doing, like, Corba? Right? Guilty. Uh, then we learned from that, and we moved on to microservices, and now we've arrived at functions. The main point here is tiny little things, stateless things that are triggered by some event that can be time, um, do something useful, and typically need to work together to achieve something. So really, it looks like that. You have a couple of triggers there. You have some management where you can upload functions as a developer um, through CLI and API uh, UI. And then you have a bunch of integrations there uh, that allow you to uh, interact with the, the rest of the world. Typically, that's where you keep your state. If you look at the use cases, um, there is, uh, well, 2016, mid-2016, a little uh, survey on, on uh, Twitter done by Patrick. And maybe if you're familiar with DevOps, you know his name. Um, and, you know, what, what looks there, 39% of the people say that what they like about serverless, really, functions as a service, is that the unit of deployment is a function. And if you look at the use cases, a couple of different sources they're used uh, to filter out uh, kind of clusters there. Um, typical things are cron job replacements, backups, pipelines, ETL jobs, uh, latency, uh, tolerant sensor readings, image thumbnails, creating that or extracting keyframes. Or Slack bots, apparently also very uh, popular there. The general landscape, um, if you look at that, CNCF has put together that, actually we recently updated that, is already a little crowded, um, not as crowded as, as you might remember from early on from the TechCrunch uh, talk as the overall space, but there's already quite a lot going on. If we zoom in and focus on the Kubernetes lands landscape as such, um, the, I will not go through the, all the, the details here, we don't have the time for that, but one uh, takeaway message is that a lot of those frameworks uh, are relatively new, and um, as you can see from the backing, pretty much everyone has at least one head uh, in, in the game, no pun intended. Let's have a look at the challenges and opportunities now. One of the questions I quite often get is, you know, does it actually make sense to run non-public functions as a service? So uh, is AWS Lambda, and that, I don't know if you can really see it here, but um, the, the news tech uh, made a, a survey there, and 70% of the people out there in this serverless setup are using uh, Lambda, and they, they definitely have a, a huge head start in that space. Um, I would argue yes, because it is one tool in the toolbox, um, and is, it is useful for certain use cases, as we've seen earlier. My pet peeve uh, is around developers on call. I've blogged about it and written about that. And essentially, the question here is, if you are introducing functions as a service in your uh, organization, um, you should have a strategy around that who at the end of the day um, will be the one who gets the, to wear a pager. Because at the end of the day, um, or since we don't have any servers anymore, we don't have any uh, infrastructure operations anymore uh, in this space, um, someone has to do uh, the so-called typical ops tasks in this context. Another area um, that is still very early days is uh, orchestration of these functions. If you're breaking down a, a monolith uh, from, you know, monolith to maybe 30 different functions, uh, 30 different microservices, that's one thing. If you go further and break it down into 200 or even more functions, there must be something that does the, the orchestration there. The only uh, open source uh, initiative I'm aware of is here from IBM. Um, I, I'd certainly be interested in if anyone has uh, anything more in that space. Summing up, um, I sometimes think about serverless or functions as a service as the VBA, the Visual Basic for Applications of Cloud Native Computing. It's a great tool, I'm a great believer, but it's one tool in the toolbox, not a silver bullet. And you have to think about the trade-offs in terms of convenience, which typically means lock-in, and control, which means a little bit of effort there. A couple of resources, all the slides are up there uh, already in PDF format and a bunch of folks uh, I'd like to thank you who helped me shape that talk in a very open way. And with that, I'd like to point out learn.openshift.com, where we will very soon release some OpenWhisk-related uh, scenarios there. Thanks a lot.